start my introduction. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Scott Safe, who is going to be giving a presentation on Gone to Pikes Peak, a Mountain of Numismatic Discovery. Take it away, Scott. Okay, thank you for inviting me. I greatly appreciate it. I hope to fly by this fairly quickly. It's a little long presentation. I'm trying to skip to some of the punch points, but uh, it's an uh, area that's obviously high importance to me, the topic. We're going to talk about going to Pikes Peak, a mountain of numismatic discovery. You know, obviously going there in the 1860s when the gold rush started in 1858, actually. It was a huge adventure for people that to cover across the prairie and to get to this region and actually try to eke out a living in the area that was really unknown. It probably meant, for those of you who know California history better than I do, what happened with the California gold rush. So you'll see a lot of similarities with metals and paper and such. But uh, I think in Colorado, it's a little bit unique being so far separated from everything else. So I'll speed through this and uh, save some time for at the end for any questions. There are three points I do want to discuss. I want to talk about, I do think that Colorado is kind of shorted at adequate treatment in HK, the Hilbert Kaplan. Hilbert was from the East, Kaplan was from the West, and I think flyover country was ignored for a large part of it. Yes, some metals were covered, but there certainly is a bigger, richer history that uh, deserves to have mentioned. Uh, second, there was big impact of the territorial gold and free silver initiatives that did carry significant numismatic and mining influence in the region. And we'll talk about the impact and what kind of happened there. And lastly, the few HKs that are available and documented in the book uh, have some interesting histories and now more coming to light that will be uh, shown here today. So we're gonna take kind of a journey uh, from the bottom of Pike Peak up to the top and then back down. I'm gonna have to save some of the more expensive, very interesting ones for the top because when you're at the summit, that's when you wanna have the grandiose discussion. So we'll do a little bit of detour on time, but I'm gonna try to stay on time within history. So first, a little bit of background. Zebulon Pike was chartered by uh, uh, President Thomas Jefferson to go explore the South, the unknown South and the West. As he was leaving St. Louis on this expedition, it was the same time that Lewis and Clark were returning from their expedition. So they kind of crossed paths to a bit, if you will. They never saw each other, but they were, you know, one was going East, one was going West. So with that, um, this is the view that uh, they would have seen as they crossed the prairies. Now, obviously there would have been millions of more buffalo at that time, but this was the only picture I could find of the prairie with a buffalo on it. So I had to use this one. Uh, but I think it's indicative that it was basically nothing but prairies, grass and, and buffalo and other animals that they saw as they traversed over that. Now, what they did in, you know, much like other expeditions at the time is they actually, you know, traversed the river courses because they wanted to find the headwaters of the rivers, which they think would be the higher peaks and probably the more interesting areas to explore. So being playing it safe, they traveled up the river when they got to what is now Colorado in this picture here, November 11th, 1806, they jumped right onto US 50 and expedited right to Pueblo. Actually, uh, US 50, as you know, didn't exist at the time, uh, but it actually traverses the same river course as the Arkansas River, which is the river path that uh, Zebulon Pike had taken. November 15th, they first sighted Pikes Peak, and then November 23rd, they camped in Pueblo, and we'll kind of see what that looks like here in a minute. The view of the Pikes Peak, once you get across the plains and you see for the first time, you know, the Rocky Mountain Range, it really truly is a sight to believe. And if you've never taken a car that direction, I would encourage you because it is a very grand spectacular display once you've gone over the, uh, the boringness of the plains and, and what's out there. Uh, so this would have been sort of the view that they would have had at the time. And they called it Grand Peak uh, in, in their notes. Once they got to Pueblo, it obviously became much more clear to them. And they clearly had already said then in their, in their diary, in Zebulon Pike's diary, this is where they wanted to go. They really wanted to explore you know, the Grand Peak. So looking at it, a map, once they got into Pueblo in late November, they decided to you know, take an expedition up from the Arkansas River to go explore you know, what now becomes Pike's Peak or Grand Peak at the time. They got up. Um, a certain amount of distance, but then had to turn around. It had snowed the day before. Snow was kind of knee to waist deep and they were not prepared for it, didn't really have the right shoes and equipment and decided to abandon, uh, wisely abandon the approach. Even in November, that seems kind of rare to have that much snow, but you know, they, they encountered a freak snowstorm. They then um, spent an amount of time just kind of traversing and exploring Colorado. I have to confess, I would not want to have been on this expedition. Multiple times, Pike just abandoned his people. If somebody got frostbite, had health conditions, 
they just left them behind, just kept going on. And they did this, you know, three or four times in very remote regions that nobody had any idea where anybody was, where anybody was going and if they were gonna come back or not. So it was kind of an interesting uh, saga that they went through. They ultimately ended up then heading back down to uh, New Mexico region, then we actually went into Mexico where they were arrested. They spent six months in prison by the Spanish troops. All of their notes, except for the diary of uh, Zebulon Pike, who, however they managed to hide it, we don't know because they were thir searched thoroughly. But all the notes are lost from that time period. And we don't really have much to say. They've been slowly cut out, all except two major pieces of it have come out. So more and more history, even to this time, um, is there. All right, so fast forward, 52 years, the rush to Pikes Peak begins because gold has been discovered. And let's kind of uh, surface what's going on numismatically here. These are sort of a quick map of some of the major mining regions um, at the time. And uh, gold and silver were sound, first found in South Park in 1859, and the Pikes Peak Gold Rush was on. Um, interesting enough, at that time, um, the city was actually called, uh, sorry, I'm going to close this out here. There we go. It was actually called, uh, Denver was actually called Montana City. It later became Denver City. Some of the residents who carried a curry favor for the territorial governor of Kansas, whose name was Denver, James Denver, not John Denver, James Denver, at the time, he actually had resigned before they had done this and they didn't know it. So they named it to curry favor, but that ended up not getting them anywhere um, in, the, in the discussion. Nonetheless, gold was discovered and the gold rush was on. So Kansas annexed a portion of uh, Eastern Colorado and the Pikes Peak region at the time. Nebraska had the upper territory and Colorado was the territory was split out as Colorado territory in 1861. Even in 1859, this is a newspaper from the San Francisco Evening Bulletin, 1859 in February, and it talked about the Pikes Peak region. So it really wasn't uh, by design that Pikes Peak region was created. It was really created by the press. You know, they named it Pikes Peak region and it really uncovered a very considerable distance. Not like the Nevada region, which is you know fairly concentrated around Carson City in that area. Uh, this is a huge swath of land where gold was being discovered kind of everywhere. So they just gave it a name and called it the Pikes Peak region. Even maps at the time called it the Pikes Peak routes to the Pikes Peak gold regions. As you can see in 1859, we already had the mail express routes to the north. We had multiple routes coming back from the east from various juncture points along the, um, the river sets. So it was very popular. So you're seeing in a very condensed time frame here, just a matter of two or three years, the extent of the development and the movement of people from the east over to the Colorado uh, to go after the gold that had been discovered. Um, coincidentally, as I was researching some of my family, I came across this uh, census record, which happens to have uh, all these members of my family history on here, the Gunnings, the Woolies, the Epleys, the Downings. And I kept noticing this little marker called Pikes Peaker. I wasn't sure what kind of job description was that. And I kept saying, maybe that's something to do with pickles or some you know, farming instrument. And it wasn't until I got down to one relative where it actually said, gone temporarily to Pikes Peak. And I was like, oh, and of course I knew that all of this family had come to Colorado to, uh, at some point, I didn't know it was during the gold rush. No one in the family had ever known this. But there was pages after pages. This is just the uh, Cedar Rapids in Iowa of everybody who had left. 1860 to go after the gold rush. So it shows how popular it really was uh, in many regions. So Colorado was formed as a territory in 1861. The political situation was evolving rapidly. Um, you had many people coming in. The only way for people to really buy things was to use the gold dust and the limited amount of coins and currency that they were able to bring with them, you know, in their wagon trains uh, to the region. Really, need that we needed to have um, coins and metals produced locally, and that started the whole focus on um, uh, what was going on. So, real quickly, Clark Gruber and Company was one of the few that started off producing coins in 1860. We're going to come back to this one when we get to the summit because I think these are the much more interesting ones to talk about, and certainly the value uh, deserves it to be talked about at the summit. But safe to say in 1860, we started to see gold dust, which was a very difficult medium to have commerce and exchange, now became into coins where it was pretty well standardized, fairly close to the US standards. So it kind of looked like coins from the yeast, smelled like coins from the yeast, uh, but it was obviously produced locally. 1862, Charles Cook and Jasper Sears. 
they formed the CA Cook Company. And while you had two and a half, five and ten dollar gold, you didn't have, you know, pennies, dime, nickels to give change to people. So they stepped in and started producing uh, fractional notes, which met that demand. So again, very short time frame, five years. You've already got gold circle coinage circulating, and you've got uh, fractional notes to uh, cover the demand for the smaller, um, smaller needs. 1866, banking was fully established. Circulating banknotes, national banknotes in Denver, Pueblo, Central City, so fairly well populated throughout the region. Again, this is only you know seven years later. We've already got the full uh, money going on. 1869, as you know, the Transcontinental Railroad came in, uh, connecting the east and the west. It traversed north of Colorado through Wyoming. Uh, the lines from Denver were then built to connect to that railroad, and so we had uh, rapid um, progress there. There was also the Kansas Pacific Railway that came in shortly after that, that went from Denver back east. So there was multiple um, train routes service in the region. 1873, the five-year depression was starting. Uh, the fourth coinage act eliminated the coinage of private silver, the ability to take your silver, go to the mint and say, please produce me um, silver coins. It ended by metallism at the time. It's a huge issue for the miners. Obviously, they really needed uh, a venue for the silver and gold that they were producing that out. That was kind of reversed with the Bland Allison Act of 1878, which required the US to purchase $2 million monthly of silver and to produce coins, so hence Morgan, Morgan Dollar. And that kind of fueled both Carson City and eventually Denver Mint uh, towards the tail end of that. 1876, Colorado became a territory was the 38th state. Um, and still to this day, this actual alignment of the stars, there is no regulation for this. So you could actually have your stars range however you want. Uh, in this case, these were two of the popular designs to designate the 38th state, Colorado. A little bit of side note, I had been searching for a long time for a Colorado-based Kansas territory medal. I came across this one on eBay. I looked at it real quickly. I had Colorado KT, this has gotta be it. I bid money on it, I got it for nothing. I arrived the day of the San Jose Coin Club meeting. I took it there for show and tell, and I stood up and I proudly said, hey, I finally found my first Kansas Territory medal. And Ken Barr, for those of you who know, Ken's out in the background, and he goes, Knights Templar. I didn't quite understand what he was talking about. And finally it dawned on me, oh, KT is actually Knights Templar, not uh, Kansas Territory. So I'm still looking for that Kansas Territory medal. I don't believe they exist, uh, but we'll see. All right, some more interesting um, medals that emerged. And this one, thanks to uh, Bill Heider and Jeff Shevlin, is now getting documented in their upcoming book, designated as SH3-41. It was a National Mining and Industrial Exposition of 1882 in Denver. This would qualify as a so-called dollar 40 millimeters white medal. Uh, it's really a nice medal. You see one or two come up a year in some of the auction houses. But the mining convention was necessary because the East Coast was financing the mines in Colorado. But what they would do is they would take a, a stock certificate of the mines, then they would do everything they could in the press and the news to try to drive down the value of the mine. They would cause the miners to lose their money. And then they would go in and swoop up the stock certificates at cheap price. They'd take that money and then invest it into the mines and reap all the profits. So Denver felt that they had to really establish credibility that mining really was a strength of the region and hence this exposition was created to help foster that. So it's quite nice metal. I really like that one. Um, there was two more that were produced at the same event. So that shows how popular it was at the time, even in 1882. Uh, this would not qualify as a so-called dollar. It's 30.5 millimeters, but there's two versions that I know of brass and white metal. Um, I, I think I said also be able in silver, but I think it's the white metal is what it is. I haven't yet tested it for uh, what the actual content is, but it's uh, 30.5 millimeters. It was produced by Asia Car Jewelry out of St. Louis, and there's been multiple medals that I've seen over the past few months come out of the Jacquard Jewelry out of St. Louis, so they seem to be fairly popular and able to explore into other regions. A lot of trading went on between Denver and St. Louis at the time, a lot of mining equipment, uh, especially in that, in that time period. Uh, just some other medals of interest. 17th Annual Encampment of the Gar was held in Denver 1883, obviously had the Pikes Peak or at least Long's Peak um, on the Front Range. If you've ever explored the Front Range of, De of Colorado, there's actually five peaks that are over 14,000 feet that you can see from the plains. It just happens to be where your entry point is as to what you'll see um, in front of you. So it could be the Denver region, it could be south, and it actually could be north Long's Peak up um, near Loveland, Fort Collins. 1890, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act passed. It was ridiculed at the time, even when it was passed, but it actually kind of doubled down on buying silver. 
and actually asked the government to buy 4.5 million ounces of silver per month more than what they currently were doing. And this was sponsored by the farmers and the miners, you know, kind of a strange uh, duopoly there, but their intent was the farmers had lots large debts and they wanted to devalue the currency and they could do that by partnering with the uh, miners who wanted to get rid of their silver that they were mining, have a market for that. And so they both partnered together to try to get the US government to do that. That act ultimately failed, led to kind of the 1893 panic and uh, the Sherman Act was repealed then. But in the same time frame, you know, Denver is accelerating their growth. They established a mining stock exchange at the time, 1891. This is the Mining Congress of Denver. Uh, from this time period, 40 millimeters aluminum, quite nice metal, uh, well put together. I uh, forget actually who produced this. Uh, I'll have to go check that again and put that on the slide. And then of course, you know, Brian Dollars were popular at the time to uh, argue for or against the Silver Purchase Act of 1890. This one actually happens to be from Denver uh, in 1891, Denver Silver. I don't know much about the history of this yet. It's just surfaced on my radar chart in the last few months. So I got a little bit more research to do here um, on this one. I actually don't own one yet. So until I get one, I'll have to see it. All right, so back to Pikes Peak. Uh, we need to get up the, the, the peak. Salmon G. Simmons, who founded the Simmons Beauty Rest Mattress Company, at the same time in 1889, decided to build a train up to the top of Pikes Peak. Why he would ever decide to do that in 1891 with few people, no idea, but he did it. And on 1891, the first train reached the summit of Pikes Peak. Um, some of the medals that came out, we'll fly through these real quick. 1892, Denver, Colorado Masonic Temple, quite nice design, pretty similar to other nine's Templar medals. Uh, 1893, of course, the Sherman Law was repealed. We're gonna start to see the impact of this more and more in Colorado coinage and medals. This one uh, from 1894, Peach Day, Grand Junction, Colorado. Why Peach Day in Utah from 1907 can be celebrated with HK 653A um, is in the book, but not the 1894 Grand Junction. I don't know. It's 36 millimeters, quite nice design. Um, was produced out of uh, Philadelphia in this case. And the one at the bottom is quite interesting. I believe this was the original trial strike, tri trial strike to the mint colored basketball coins of 2020. Uh, looks very similar to the ones that just came out from the U.S. Mint. Uh, this one here, I really like the Denver Livestock Commission Company, um, mainly because of the design that's shown here in detail down to the left. Not a great picture, but, you know, the bucking horse steering the calf and the rider getting thrown off with his gun flailing in the side. That was pretty indicative of what was happening with the farming and ranching community at the time. The Livestock Commission, which still exists today uh, in the Denver Union Stockyards, it's a very popular event in January, always held in January, uh, January, February timeframe, you know, highlighting they sold 24,000 cattle at the it's time. Uh, this one I just recently purchased. It's a nice educational medal, instruction in all branches. Instruction is kind of written out a little bit uh, in all branches the same way, knowledge and culture. It's a very nice design. The photo doesn't do it justice. And then it's just really simply from the principal at the time. Uh, and 34 millimeters should qualify, at least size-wise for a HK, but certainly the school connotation, I think, throws it out of the running. All right, we'll hit a few mountain plains just to show you some of the examples of the acceleration of metals being produced at the time in 1895. We had the Festival of Mountain Plain. I think this is a die trial strike. It's a uniface, uh, kind of on a white metal pewterish type um, um, content. The 1896 Crystal Carnival in Leadville where they build the Leadville Ice Castle or used to build the Leadville Ice Castle every year to see when it melted in the spring uh, is produced. The San Juan uh, Pioneer Association, this one I really like. It turns out my great, great grandfather was one of the first pioneers to the San Juan, which would have been Silverton. Um, in the time he actually cut the road, first road to Silverton. He was a brick manufacturer. He built the first smelter in, in Silverton and they actually brought out the first uh, brick of silver from Silverton. And this was 18, uh, I'm stretching my mind, I think 1874 or 75. I have to go back in my notes in that time frame, But anyway, I, I purchased this one just to uh, kind of commemorate that. A lot of fairs going on in the region, Arkansas Valley Fair, 1897, Watermelon Day, um, sponsor and all these kind of fit the uh, HK designation type set. Festival of Mountain Plains again in 1897. We see the Festival of Mount, Mount M.O. 
Anton. If you ever had any doubt that this was designed to have a hole in the middle, there is no doubt that there was because Mount 10 was separated to specifically allow for the hole to be produced. Uh, in this case, I really like this one. Just personal note, this is the May Daniels and Fisher Tower, the merger of the May Company and Daniels and Fisher, which is another retail store. They were gonna tear this down in um, 1976 and me and my friends went out there with protest signs for days on end, uh, protesting them tearing it down. So it still stands today and I'm, it's a very gorgeous building if you ever get a chance on 16th Street Mall to see it. Uh, very nice design, very elegant inside. 1897 Fifth Annual Flower Carnival was being produced. So, you know, again, we're starting to get into the hundreds of thousands of people in Colorado. And of course, you would see this type of evolution in there. Another event yet not yet documented, the first international gold mining convention in Denver in 1897. Uh, I like this one. It's got the typical miner profile, but it's also the only coin I've ever seen or metal I've seen where Denver is the only city in North and South America that's highlighted. Uh, so I particularly like that one for that. I don't know much about this and trying to research this one. It's really pretty hard to find. You need to get to the uh, libraries in Denver to go search the records. Mountain and Plain, 1898. So this is post the cancellation of the Sherman Act, 1898. You can't read it here, but it says slaves to silver in the cat's whiskers uh, that are out there. So the impact of the silver was really starting to play down on the people. And even in the popular events at the time, this being the Mountain and Plains Festival, you started to see the political impact coming out. Saxon Lawyer was one of the predominant manufacturers of metals at that time based in Denver. And they produced these at least into 1850, or 1956 that I know of. And we'll talk about that one uh, coming up here in a few minutes. Some other carnivals that are there, I'll just fly by these to uh, save us some time here, but you know, continued in that venue. All right, so we're gonna go up to the Summit House, which was built in 1901 at the top of Pikes Peak. This metal depicts the first Summit House. You can see the uh, picture of it, uh, mimicking the design of the Summit House up at the top and obviously the uh, Cog Railway and where it lands up at the top of the Summit. They have served donuts at the top since the early 1890s. If you've never had a donut at the top of Pikes Peak, they are delicious, but I guarantee you eat them at the top. If you take them down, they turn horrid because of the change in elevation. It does something bad to the donut, so eat it up at the top. All right, remember these three areas. They're gonna be very important here. Um, Denver in this region here, um, the Breckenridge area in this region, and then of course, Cripple Creek in this, because we're gonna come back to this twice, and you're gonna see similarities about what happened uh, in this environment. But I promised that we would um, hit some of the popular items going on. So obviously, Lesher Dollars is pretty important. Lesher was in Cripple Creek, which is very close to Pikes Peak by as the crow flies. But the only way to really get there is you got to go up and way up and over to get to Pikes Peak. It's a long journey, a very arduous journey to get there. It would have been even more difficult in, the, in that time frame to do. However, not many people know this, but the Pikes Peak silver mine is the moniker on all but the first uh, Lesher Dollar. It is kind of interesting because it does say Pikes Peak Silver Mine. There never really was a mine on Pikes Peak. Yeah, there was a couple mines. They tried to produce things, but there was nothing ever of this magnitude on Pikes Peak. They really never found silver or gold on Pikes Peak to speak of. You can go in Colorado anywhere. You can you know, find little bits of gold dust, little bits of silver here and there occasionally, especially at that time frame. But there never really was really Pikes Peak mines that had anything to do with it. It was the region. It wasn't necessarily just Pikes Peak. 1901, Colorado would turn 25. Um, this medal came from Jan Rameau. Uh, I first found out about it a few years ago in Jan's research. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was invited to speak at the centennial. He had visited Colorado to go hunting in Meeker, Colorado of all places uh, in January. He was invited back in uh, August to go speak at this event. Coincidentally, one month later, McKinley spoke at the Pan American Expo where he was shot and ultimately died from his wounds. And it would have been um, interesting if the Colorado Festival was one month later, would they have reversed trips with each other? And maybe it would have been Teddy Roosevelt who uh, didn't make it. We'll never know. But he spoke, he spoke primarily about the conquest and settlement of the West he thought was the greatest task of, that the US had ever uh, produced. This medal is quite nice. It unfortunately is 32 millimeters, doesn't really qualify as an HK medal. Occasionally you can see it with the original ribbon, red, white, and blue. Uh, Jan's research showed it was probably about 2,000 estimated were struck, not really clear what it was, how many. They usually can be found in pretty good condition. I see typically one to two per year um, on eBay at least coming up. 
The, uh, this is the first medal that I know of that actually had the moniker Pikes Peak or Bust. So even in that time frame, 1901, this was a fairly popular statement that represented the settlers coming in um, into the Pikes Peak region. And we'll come back to this red, white, and blue ribbon because that actually was not the colors of the state flag at that time. Now I picked this medal up uh, about a, two years ago in Denver at a coin show. And I thought, oh great, I just discovered a new, um, you know, Quarto Centennial Celebration Medal. And I thought this was really cool. So I bought it, I put it away. I didn't really research it till just a few months ago. And then I noticed something very odd about this medal. And if you had counted things on here, you probably would have seen it right away. There's 50 stars on this medal. There's no way that the Colorado Quarto Centennial when they're the 38th state, there was not 50 states to be known of. So I think this was actually done probably sometime in the 1860s or 1960s. Um, and I don't know yet. I have since found another medal unrelated to Colorado that actually has that exact same uh, characteristics to the medal. I try to collect them by characteristics because it helps tie in the manufacturers to each other and how you can uh, articulate that. 1903, very big labor wars in the mines. Uh, Governor Peabody was elected as a Republican. He kind of took over the Democratic uh, led state at the time. This medal was produced. He ran on a law and order campaign to uh, basically qualm the, the wars of the labor unions. And he won, ultimately won out. It's very common in um, uh, copper, very uncommon in white metal. Very hard to find uh, the, that version in white metal, but would not be an HK because of its political nature. Uh, Sam and G. Simmons helped sponsor the 39th Guard in 1905. He did it because he gave this as a medal to everybody and you used it in exchange. You could get a free ride up his, um, up his train up to the top of Pikes Peak so you could go buy a donut. All right, we're gonna keep moving. The views are getting interesting. Denver 1905, the uh, HK 876, the trial run of the Denver Mint, which was being produced in Denver. It opened up in 1905 on a trial run basis. This medal was produced in bronze and silver. Uh, NGC is, cert is certified in uh, 876B gold plated bronze. I have no idea why they did that. There never was a gold plating facility in the Denver Mint. I know that because my grandfather worked there and he said there never was any gold plating. They, they had gold obviously, and it's one of the largest repositories of gold, but they didn't do gold plating. This was done most likely after the fact by somebody, but NGC certified it, which is quite strange. 1906, here we are hundred years later, Zebulon Pike, the discovery is hundred years old. It's time to have another celebration. What do you do when you want to have a celebration? You want to raise money? because they wanted to produce a statue to Zebulon Montgomery Pike, um, which they tried to do with the design of this, with the sales of this metal. Unfortunately, they didn't raise enough money and they ended up uh, not being able to produce it. And still to this day, they don't have a great statue of uh, Montgomery Pike in Colorado Springs, surprisingly. They got their favorite Congressman, Mr. Brooks, to sponsor a bill. He specified in the bill that this metal was going to be struck at the new Denver, Colorado Mint. So in March 1906, that was the intent as it navigated through Congress, navigated through the Mint. It actually turns out that the Mint equipment that was designated for Denver and one of the delays of the reason the Mint never opened on time was the equipment was sent to the Louisiana Purchase Centennial for the 1903-1904 Centennial. And I produced these metals, the HK301 series um, at that time then. So we know the equipment could produce metals, but it was just busy doing that. And it took forever to get the, the metals from St. Louis back to Denver uh, where it was really originally designed. So hence, uh, with all these delays and construction delays, they were really rushed to get the gold and silver coinage going in 1906. You know, who needs a, a stinking so-called dollar to be produced in Denver? And it ultimately ended up being produced in Philadelphia for time expediency because the event was held in August. Uh, a number were produced, you know about this series, uh, 100 each were in silver, gold, and bronze were uh, put together with a bar and a ribbon. Now that ribbon is very interesting because the colors are this colors of the original Colorado flag. That's what I believe, because the flag was known to be gold and yellow, but they have yet to this day never have found a sample of the original Colorado flag. Uh, they're still looking, but they've never found that. But I believe that th those were the colors because this would have fit the time frame. The flag would have been, you know, 26 years old or something like that at the time. And then shortly after that, uh, Colorado moved to have the flag as you know it today, the red, white, and blue moniker. Uh, that was the design. So there was a kind of a transition point, which I think the 1901 medal actually is signifying because in that time frame, there was a lot of debate down in Colorado Springs about whether the flag would, should be what it was or should it go to this new flag 
given that it was a centennial state and maybe they should mimic the uh, US flag. Um, more research to be done there. Um, I happen to have uh, one of the 25 that were serialized. They serialized 25 of these to uh, raise money. A good friend of mine, John Dean, has the number 10 version of that. And I've never heard of any other that have been found. Uh, these either have been lost or people have them and just don't know it that if you turn it over, there is a engraving on there, number five, and this one's number 10. Uh, but we're still on the lookout for those. If you see them, let us know. And then strangely, this one has shown up recently. The, the flag has always been uh, this blue and uh, gold color. Uh, red, white, and blue has started to show up. I saw this. Now, I don't know if this is a modern one. I've had a number of people look at it. It seems to be pretty clean, but it might have just been this specimen. Really need to find some more, but you can see the flag transition was happening in the same time frame. There is an Im imitation that's out there. If you find one, let me know. I've really been on the lookout for that one. I've just never found one of these HK339s. Very rare, you know, kind of the thin air of Pikes Peak. A number of other Pikes Peak medals from the region, none of them qualify as HK due to its size, but they need to be investigated and uh, part of the work in progress. Two interesting medals, the Grand Lodge of Reunion in 1906, it's got the first United States Mint, Denver, Colorado on the background. Also has, uh, the other one I've seen has been the signal station of Summit Pikes Peak has the same background for the Denver Mint. Coincidentally, these look to me exactly like 343A and 726 in the HK book. And I think this, they were produced by the same manufacturer, but nobody knows who produced any of these. So we don't have the history yet identified, but they sure seem to be very similar in design in striking the identical characteristics, the, the outline, the layout, you know, the flat line at the bottom on each one of these just feels like it's kind of pretty much the same manufacturer. And when you line up the two that I have that I showed, they, they very much are definitely the same uh, reverse de die, die design. All right, we're at the summit. We're gonna get to the interesting piece. Three gold rushes transpired in, in the US. 29 was Piedmont, Cal North Carolina. 1848 was the gold rush, California. 1858 was the Colorado gold rush, also known as the 29ers, the 49ers, and the 59ers, respectively. In those same three regions that we kind of talked about earlier, the territorial gold was first produced, and this is back to 1860. So we're at the top of the summit, but we're going back to 1860 to hit the gold. There was uh, four major efforts that, that transpired. The two in Denver, the uh, doc, what I call the Dr. Parsons Project in Cripple Creek and Breckenridge J.J. Conway to produce these. Um, the first one is the Howard's Assay Office in Central City. This, he, they built, moved to Central City in 1862 from Denver, but they actually produced a, a design for this and only five patterns are known to exist from this uh, thread at a $5 um, and up to a $20 that were produced. There's very few of these. They're very ultra rare, very difficult to find on the market. Of course, Clark Gruber, everybody knows the Bank of Mint <clears throat> eventually became and was bought out by the US to become the Denver Mint, uh, but they started in July of 1860. Their first dye trial had the same peak nomenclature. It's really a debate as to, you know, who did what first? Was it, um, the Denver City Assay Office, or was it Clark Gruber who did the Mountain Peaks? But they're very identical. Just, you know, Clark Gruber seemed to be a bit more rushed, just being sort of a pyramid design, whereas the Denver City actually, you know, at least tried to create a peak. But there's just, they're too similar to not have either competed with each other or shared dye designers or something. But that fact is a little bit unknown. Oh, and also the, uh, the Denver City versus Denver. Denver City was the original name, and then City was dropped just to become Denver uh, kind of in that same time frame. Pikes Peak Gold, these are the high demand items. Um, you've seen the 1860. What's interesting here is the Clark and Company is the headband of uh, the design. And of course, the eagle on the back mimicking US coin designs. But then in 1861, they made the shift. They changed it from Clark Gruber to all of the headbands said Pikes Peak. So they were very clearly picking up on the trend towards the region being called Pikes Peak. Why fight it? Why not go along with it? It would broaden the spread of the coins. And that's exactly what they did. And they became the predominant manufacturer of gold coins for the entire region. The others kind of fell off by the wayside. Uh, just some auction prices to show you. You've got to really save up a lot of money for these. Some of the higher items, uh, 111,000, 305,000 for an XF45, 20, 1860, 176,000 and 690,000 for an MS64, 1860, $20. There are some very lofty prices. So save your pennies now if you want to get one of these. 
I did note the 19060. This is one of the first 13 that were produced in March of 1906. Again, relegating the Pikes Peak metal to be produced in Philadelphia. This recently sold a few years ago for 440,000 with the actual paperwork that documented it was, um, I think this was number six on the group of 13 that were first struck in a ceremony at the Denver Mint. Great book on the Denver Mint, pioneer Denver Mint, Clark Gruber is uh, out by Noli Mummy. We'll come back to Noli Mummy in a minute. Uh, lastly, wrapping it up with J.J. Conway. J.J. Conway produced these in July and August of 1861 in Georgia Gulch, which is near present-day Breckenridge Company. These dyes were discovered back in uh, 1929, I believe is when they were discovered by a gentleman who had bought the house from uh, the original founder of the Mountain Bell Telephone Company at the time. Uh, very nice house, way up in the attic in a small cigar box off in the corner were these dyes. Um, he sat on them for about 15 years. The great article that Bill and Jeff did uh, in Tam's article that we'll reference at the bottom to read the history of these. They did a restrike of these. Uh, they're very rare to find. These coins are extremely hard. There's, you look at the population census, it's one or two maybe of each and that's about it. So very, very difficult to find. Not very popular um, implemented. A Striking was done to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Denver Mint in 1956. It was very difficult to get the dyes. They actually used the dyes to make copies of the dyes so that they could produce these coins. They did 600 of these. These are hard to find. You can find them occasionally. They typically go for 600 to $1,000 for the set that was produced at the time. These are the modern day restrikes. If you find these, do not buy these. You can get them for 99 cents and oftentimes people will just give them to you because they're fairly uh, common, um, but they are the restrikes and they've got the dimple, which is a defect on the die um, it, that it was created, but do not spend money on these. They're, they're not worth it. And lastly, of course, Dr. Parsons project down in Terriol, which is near um, the original Pikes Peak area region. He did some trial strikes. He brought his own uh, six stamp quartz reduction mill in his wagon. He also brought his own coin press. Why he decided to do that and settle down in that region probably trying to figure out how to make money on it. But unfortunately, he really only produced die trial strikes and he did it on top of mostly um, standard US coins, the limited coins that the people had with them at the time. These are also very extremely rare, uh, very difficult to find. You, you won't find these unless you uh, take your metal detector and hopefully find one in the dirt. All right, we're at the summit. Um, we've hit the expensive stuff. We're gonna zoom down to the bottom real quick. I'm just going to cover a few items of interest to uh, kind of lay this out and we'll get into the standardized silver issues. So these are the Pedley Ryan dollars from uh, 1933. Uh, these were produced to really just to sell silver at the time. It was done by Pedley Ryan. They wanted an advertising vehicle. They decided to create these metals. They were basically hand stamped by the, uh, as they call it, the lady in the office. You know, she basically took a hammer and stamped them on there. There was multiple designs that came out of it, a few deviations. This is one through four. Uh, this is the type five through seven with the most deviations coming out of this one with Robins uh, on the corner at the top and Robins on the corner down at the bottom. Um, not too many of these were sold. Another one was done, uh, I forget the state that it was in, but it, it actually was recalled by the manager. So they weren't very successful with this and kind of abandoned it. Uh, they're not, as rare, the the simple the A25 is the most common one. Some of the other ones, like the one on the right, there's only about 50 of these known, so they're very difficult to find. Although I did see one sell on eBay for about 400 bucks, they typically go for about 4,000. So sometimes on eBay you can get good deals on that. Uh, then 1933, Colorado wanted to be at the Century of Progress. They were late in doing it. So the State Immigration Board actually got involved at the tail end and tried to create something to raise money to uh, at least have a Colorado presence at the Century of Progress event. They produced a, a number of these. They were not good sellers. So they kept you know, changing the design to fine tune it, see if it made it more popular and ultimately ended up with kind of imitating the Nevada silver dollar. Um, the HK19, I think is the number. And that one is the most popular you'll see today is the HK19. Uh, but these are fairly common. You can get these for, you know, two to 400 each and sometimes less, and especially on the one on the right in rapid. But again, it was really to sell, sell silver and raise money and, you know, kind of promote the region. And then lastly is the 1974 Colorado souvenir slugs. These were produced uh, up near um, Empire, Colorado by one gentleman who was a miner. 
ended up not being successful and kind of ran a gift shop to advertise, you know, uh, visitors to the mine to, uh, you know, buy something in the gift shop. Not many of these are known out there. They're fairly large, 38 millimeters in size, typically, kind of all stamped, trying to emulate some of the others. Uh, Dan Carr and I from Colorado, those who know Dan, we're tracing these rather aggressively. We've actually come up with a complete list of which ones were issued. And between the two of us, I think he's green, I'm pink, and yellow we both share, if I remember it correctly. We found every one of them at Central City. There may be others, but they're not very well documented. There is a TAMS article from 76, I think, uh, but very difficult to find. You don't see these come up very often. So the similarity on um, both the uh, silver designs and the gold designs coincidentally, for some strange reason, comes down to they were all produced in the exact same three regions that the gold was produced in the 1860s. These silver ones done in the 1900s were all produced from exactly the same three regions in Colorado. Coincidence? I don't know. You tell me, completely different people and individuals, uh, almost 100 years apart in some some areas of difference, but it is quite strange that the had the gold and the silver come from the exact same three regions of Colorado. All right, last one I'm gonna show for tonight to wrap it up is you have to end on satire. And so I wanted to take one medal that uh, Bill Hyder and Jeff Shevlin had documented in TAMS, I thought very well, but it plays into the whole Pikes Peak uh, nomenclature. And so I thought I'd pull it up. And this is the uh, Thomas Elder satire piece uh, from 1909 you know, connotating the 1909 ANA election. And those of you who fo follow Thomas Elder's medals, um, he, I love his stuff. He's very creative. I uh, kind of see a lot of that same creativity and uh, poking at the government and others, you know, and, and Dan Carr and some of his medals out of the Moonlight Mint. Uh, but in this one, I just wanted to point out a few things on this one. There was two of them. I'm only going to show the one. There was a couple things that were interesting. Of course, now Elder was, um, you know, he was the respected dealer in Ferenc Zerb. You all know him much better than I do, certainly, um, being from the PCNS or the founder, of the, one of the founders of the PCNS. You know, he was the promoter. And when they ran for their candidates, ran for the ANA governor in 1909, it became a very vicious political battle. And Elder actually created two medals to really slam um, Ferenc Zerbi and what he was doing in his past dealings. Some of the uh, con not coin in 1909, I get one dollar. This was all hitting on the fact that he was the promoter at the 1904 Lewis, Louisiana Purchase Expo, who was the official promoter of the medals. 1905 at the Lewis and Clark, he did the, uh, the Fox Gold medals. And then certainly in 1908, when he bought the numismatist um, and then tried to run that with the ANA for a couple of years, he ended up charging the ANA more for that and was pocketing the dollar. So hence, I get one dollar, had many connotations related to that that Zerbi was just not a trustworthy individual. And certainly uh, Elder was connotating uh, his, his uh, summit of impudence, the fact that he was using Fox gold. And then certainly the Piker's Peak gold is the one I wanted to focus on. You know, Piker's Peak has multiple connotation. Uh, it could say that it's Fox gold. Piker, and I think in British language is uh, Jeff and Bill highlighted in their metal or their article really meant tramp or vagabond because Zerbi was kind of one who tra traveled all over figuring out where he could make a dime and he would go do that. Uh, but then certainly because Zerbi wanted the um, next day in a governor to come from the West. And as you all know, the reason why is because he was going to move out to the West. And he did so in 1915 and certainly uh, you know, founded the PCNS in 1915. But the Pikes Peaker then has multiple meanings. This is the Fox Gold approach. It was the facts that Pikes Peak as you learned today, really did not have gold on it, which really just kind of connotated that Zerbi, you know, was a con artist at the time and um, Elder made it known. And this was kind of widely circulated at the ANA. Um, you all know who won that, that uh, election. So that's really what I had to share today and uh, hope you enjoyed it. I think, you know, the key, one of the key takeaways, Pikes Peak, it's definitely a mountain, but it's more, more like a region. And it spanned a hundred years plus of some very interesting new McMatic treasures, many underrated, many not known, and just now really starting to come to, to market and be documented. I would encourage you, you know, if you ever get a chance to go to uh, Colorado and visit Pikes Peak, that you, you do so, but wait till at least after May 2021, if not just for COVID, but certainly um, Pikes Peak is closed because the railway is being redone and the visitor center is being done. So you can drive up. Uh, but it's actually fun, funner to take the train up and down. It's really a very beautiful ride. 
and a lot of historical, all the uh, little areas where the, the builders of the Cog Railway, where they had their little camps, you see everything that they had, all the tin cans that they had and the equipment, they just left it by the side. And it's still there because it's so cold and frozen most of the year that you know it hasn't really disintegrated uh, to any significant magnitude. You got to have a donate up at the top, but you know, there's other places to visit. Colorado Springs is a very interesting area. You have Pikes Peak, you got the Cogway to the summit and the Summit House. Don't forget having a donut. The ANA headquarters is in Colorado Springs, a gorgeous building, very great museum to see, a lot of books. You can spend days at the ANA headquarters alone. Uh, the Denver Mint is up in Denver, very good tour. Someday I'll tell you about my interesting stories of uh, being a teenager at, you know, near the Denver Mint. And then certainly if you get a chance to go up to uh, Loveland and visit the Moonlight Mint, Dan Carr's got a fabulous uh, Denver Mint press that he has since purchased um, and is able to you know, run his business on, his, on the Moonlight Mint, producing many nice medals and tokens for that. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry about the time, but uh, hope this was useful for you. No problem with the time, Scott. Thank you very much. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, anyone have any questions for Scott? Uh, I can um, uh, say a, a couple things in your talk, Scott. The uh, 339, HK 339, the, um, um, uh, that particular medal from the elements on it was struck by uh, Schwab stamp and seal. And then you showed the uh, San Francisco Cliff House post office. Uh, the post office design uh, appears on a smaller heart-shaped metal uh, struck by uh, Schwab stamp and seal. So I believe those metals were also struck by Schwab. Whether or not that applies to the New Orleans medal, I can't say, but um, th those two uh, you can put in your notes for further research. Ah, that's a very good lead. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Great. Any other questions? Um, Scott, uh, this is Eric. I, I was looking at some of the pictures and then some of the representations of Pikes Peak on different um, tokens. And um, do you notice any correlation between how it's represented and where the token was made? Because <laughs> it seems like in some of them, it's kind of a, a flatter, wider mountain. And then in some, it's, it's that um, big peak. Um, yeah, really good question. I, I have spent hours trying to solve that uh, question. And the conclusion I've come to is you really can't because the front range, as I said, there's five peaks that, you know, some are set back a little bit, but some are right on the front range that are over 14,000 feet. And you can take any one of them and photograph it from 360 degrees different angles and they all start to look alike. And it really just depends on elevation and the camera lens and how wide the view frame is and when the picture was made because the cameras have changed lenses over time. I just have never been able to pinpoint that. Really difficult question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, so currently, last call for. Um... Oh, and Scott, you can unshare now. <laughs>